you guys. Good evening. Welcome to the Obelisk. Uh, tonight's guest is Jason Quitt. Jason is a graduate of the Institute of Energy Wellness and a student of Algonquin shamanism. He has been training and working with many teachers, shamans, and additional healers from around the world. You can go read the rest of it in the description. And he's got a new book out called Astral Genesis, correct? Correct. Or is it Ancient Astral? That's right. All right. And I started reading it, but I haven't finished it. And I'm sorry, Jason. I admit it. <laughs> but Nish has worked through more. So anyway, we're going to talk about that and a bunch of other stuff tonight. Hope you have a good time. Jason is in the chat. If you have questions, put them in there. And Jason, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Doing good. Always like uh, coming on your show. and um, We love having you. Good chats. And I know you read enough of the book to get the gist, so I'm not worried about anything. I took pictures and, and, and sent them to you. I know. Well, plus, <laughs> plus, we did a deep dive on Cosmic Salon, and I am part of Noxmente Diabolus, so I'm representing for our show here tonight. Part of. I can tell you, this is a groundbreaking piece of work. You are shaking it up, Jason. You've brought in absolutely new information. You know you're going to get haters on this, and uh, which means you're right over the target. This work is incredible. The chat we already had was really rich. And as a person who edited it and has listened to a couple of your other chats, it's got information that has nobody else picked your brain like that. So it's um, this is deep work. This is relevant work. And right now, this is your opus. So I'm very I just want to say on the record, I'm very proud of you for doing this. And it's very bold in a way that is subtle. Like, I don't think people understand how this is This is going to age well. It's going to change things. And you know this. So let's get in and talk about your some of your inspiration. And we talked about this, but there's something magical, Jason, that happens when you, you were researched, you're in the middle of another book, you're doing other things, and then this comes upon you. And this is something I think is worth noting, that when information comes upon us from wherever it comes and it changes your trajectory, especially if it's going to contradict some of the stuff you've written in the past, you're on to something. And so how did you find yourself in this particular muse pool to get something new going? I, I have a process and it's um how do i explain this it's it's a spiritual process of writing where um i have a course like i know i know where i want to take the information or i have an idea of where i'm going to start with the information but i have no middle and no end you know so i have this general question in my mind that's um you know and with this book it wasn't even Astral Genesis. It was the Egyptian Postures book I was writing, the uh, second Egyptian Postures book, which was um, about the moon and different um, correspondences between ancient religions and the stars. And I was just kind of allowing that information to come to me. And I had to do um, a lot of, uh, I wouldn't call it um, like deep diving research where um, I started to learn a lot about astrology, uh, about the different zodiac signs, the stars, and then I would start going back and reading the old myths, reading about you know what each constellation meant, but what it meant to different cultures to kind of get the themes of what's going on or the ideas of each constellation. And I was really focusing on uh, the work in Egypt, which is... Um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, um, the, especially the pyramid texts, and going back, you know, reading the spells of the coffin texts and spells, and uh, basically just absorbing myself in that information. And it's like every time I started to stretch my mind into that direction through the meditations, I would just get flooded 
with new concepts and new information. And um, so usually it comes at nighttime. So I'll be almost falling asleep. And then suddenly my mind will start working, uh, working itself up and putting things together that I didn't think of before, where I have to like open my eyes, uh, grab my cell phone and start writing notes in my cell phone. And then when I wake up the next morning, I take those notes and I try to find those answers or to make those connections. And that's how um, I got all this information in this book was just kind of letting the muse, letting my higher self, the universe, whatever you want to call it, just basically guide me down this path. So originally I was looking for um, demystifying the ancient texts because they're all these texts, they're basically written in a way of where if, if you read it, the actual meaning and knowledge of these works is very well hidden. It's almost like you have to be initiated into um, mysticism, uh, secret understandings, uh, metaphysical concepts. You have to be like initiated into this knowledge so that when you read the text, you're gonna have a completely different understanding of what's being said than just a, a regular person reading the text. It may not make any sense to them. They may take it literal. They may think, oh, you know, these, you know, they're, they're worshiping um, gods with different animal heads or the sun or, or this or that. So my whole thing was I wanted to take these very complex, very rich um, metaphysical occulted texts and try to demystify it to say they're really talking about um, astrology or they're really talking about biology or they're really talking about alchemy. Um, I just wanted to kind of get to the root of what is the knowledge that they're trying to pass through um, their ancient texts and work. And that's what kind of led me down this path. And I, I would say I've been working on this um, for over a year because I started writing the first Egyptian postures of power book. Um, I would say two summers ago and then took a little break, but then I got right back into it writing again. And I, you know, I've been making these notes and, and meditating on this since uh, the beginning of the summer. So it took, it took at least a year to get all this information together and then really put it together from the summer till now. But um, that's how I got started going down this path. And it was just a very simple question is, um, well, I, you know, let me just go back a little. The concept of the second book, which is not released yet, which was the Egyptian Postures of Power, the second level to that, um, it was all about the moon and the moon is the, about the hidden it's about the unconscious it's about the dark the the night not dark as in darkness but about nighttime so it's about this polarity between the sun during the day and the moon the night and it has to do with uh, the path of the soul um, so when um, someone dies in the ancient texts especially back in egypt they would um, go with the sun into the underworld of night. And you would progress through the underworld just like the sun progresses through the night sky until it's reborn again um, on the eastern horizon. So I wanted to take that concept of the journey of the soul through the night and how the ancient peach people saw death and the afterlife and then how it was the gateway to rebirth, to resurrection, to ascension. And as I started to research that and, and really kind of sit with that information, that's when all this new stuff started to come into my mind, come into my awareness. And it pulled me in a completely different direction where I had to stop writing the Egyptian postures book and focus all my all my energy on saying this is a little different and 
it's very important that I separate this work and put it into the book, Astral Genesis. So let's, let's look at some ideas here of, I think everyone is at least familiar with, of going forth by day, the Egyptian book of the dead. Will you bring us into a general knowing about the pyramid text? Sure. Um, the pyramid text is the Egyptian book of the dead. It's just a, a version of it that exists on the walls of the tombs. So the pyramid text would be uh, in the ancient chambers of the pyramid or burial chambers. And um, this is when you go in and the walls are completely covered with beautiful artwork that shows the journey of the deceased going to the path through the underworld. So going to Osiris, um, going through the stars, becoming the gods, going through purification rites, having to pass certain gates, um, pass certain hours in the night, come face to face with demons, overcome the demons. <laughs> so this is like a, a very old tradition so that uh, when the deceased starts his journey in the afterlife, they have the work, they have the the um, the map written right on the walls of the chambers, the burial chambers, um, the coffin spells or the coffin texts, right in the sarcophagus. They also write the spells, they write um, the depictions on how to travel through the worlds of the afterlife. So everything was designed in a way where that story that um, journey, that path is right there recorded for the deceased to travel, to be resurrected, to be reborn again, and, and to pass judgment, basically. So, you know, there's many names for this, and uh, but it's all basically uh, the same type of concept that's evolved over time. And uh, we simply call it uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or the Pyramid Texts, or the Coffin Spells, but it's all basically uh, the journey of that the soul takes after death, and how to be reborn and rejoin the gods, or to become immortal like the gods and sit in heaven. And so, I, you know, I'm sorry, I know we, we get into this stuff deeply, and we have another chat, so I just want to make sure that everyone kind of understands the core here. So I'm asking these questions for those people out there. So why was there a distinction between the priests and the pharaohs being able to have access to this information, but not say the common Egyptian? Well, later on it evolved to where um, the priests had opened it up and it became more of a monetary thing. So, as in, if you give, if you give, uh, like, if you give money, um, if you give your wealth and and your property to the priests, um, you would be mummified and you would join them as well. Um, but when it came to the ascension, you know, I'll call it that, the ascension to uh, the northern sky of the gods, the highest throne of the gods, the indestructible stars of the northern hemisphere. Um, to get to that level of heaven, what they believed, um, that was the rejoining of a pharaoh to becoming a god. Uh, and this was very hidden, very mystical, and it wasn't really given out to the public. But over time, it kind of just kind of generalized where if you had if you wanted access to heaven you just had to follow uh, the priest and go through the different rituals and um, then Osiris would judge you in the hall of judgment so it was really up to you but um, there's always been um, initiations and levels of secrecy going back to the earliest religions and some of these concepts yeah, especially a lot of the concepts that are in this book, it's 
not normal information for the public. And, you know, if you start going down further into history, when you get into different biblical traditions, you have the majority of people that look at these texts as literal and historical. Whereas if you were initiated into these um, higher aspects of metaphysical thinking or uh, connected to the priesthood, you would know that the outright stories that are given to the people are just that. They're the stories given to the people so that they have their religious beliefs and dogmas and laws. But between the texts or hidden in the text are the real teachings that only the priests and the pharaohs and those initiated were allowed to know. So it was like two different uh, caste civilizations living amongst each other where one knows the real meanings and then most of the general population, they don't have a clue. And that's also a way of holding power and then keeping information from generation to generation. And then, so again, where did this, at least what we know and what we can surmise, where did all this information come from? How did this descend into, in the old kingdom, the pharaohs and the priest class? Well, this is the mystery. And what I have found, and it's not just me, it's, you know, many people have seen this, is that um, the general themes or the knowledge that's hidden within these texts are found in many ancient civilizations, it's not just one. Maybe the cast and characters may have changed, but the stories and the motifs and the hidden information is exactly the same. And it go and when you keep digging, it goes back to such a remote history that it becomes a lost history where we don't even know who the originators of this knowledge were. All we know is that the information was so important that it was given to, call it the priestly class, or given to um, record keepers or wisdom keepers that passed it through the generations. Um, and this was like the most important thing in their entire life, where they had to continue this information from the most remote history that we have going back to at least the last ice age. Um, and we can see it kind of coming, you know, I don't want to say coming to America, the Americas, because it may have already been here at the same time as Samaria, you know, so we don't, we, we have a whole history that we don't know about that. There may have been civilization here in South America, Central America, and North America, uh, even earlier than recorded texts in Samaria. And they're finding uh, new sites all the time. I think they just found a site in Florida um, near the intercoastal where they're building. And I think uh, they found um, buildings going back to about 8,000, 9,000 years old. So there is a lot of history in America, Central America, and South America that would have the same time stamp as even before Samaria, you know, who knows, maybe there's a Gobekli Tepe type civilization that was in South America in the rainforest. We just don't know yet, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this information has been passed down on all continents from a very remote history. And one of the things that's very exciting about your new work is that you've cracked this code that supports what you're saying here. Yes. And I thought I was going crazy. And you know that movie uh, with Jim Carrey, the, the 23, like he sees 23 everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a lot of people that have that um, psychological issue. <laughs> so um, when I first started to crack these symbols in Egypt, or you know, decode these symbols in Egypt, I was decoding them uh, geometrically. 
uh, at first. I was doing it geometrically, seeing what angles were these made in, and I kept over and over seeing that seeing that um, when the image or when the symbol has to do with a solar motif, like if it shows a solar deity, a solar god, or it's depicting a sun, something solar, um, that the entire image would have very specific angles to it. And so I would take one image and I would put these angles in it. And I'll just say um, there's a couple, there's a couple main solar angles. One is around the 23.5 degrees. And 23.5 degrees is the tilt of the earth. They teach you this in grade school. All right, every child will be taught this. This is not new information <laughs> at all. Um, it's what gives us our seasons so that the earth tilts and wobbles like every single year. And from the equator, it tilts 23.5 degrees uh, to the north, which gives us our summer and 23 degrees to the south, or sorry, south, which gives us our winter, yeah. And um, those angles, this 23 degree angle was there. And, and by the way, this angle uh, shifts slightly over 40,000 years. So it goes from like 24.2 degrees to about 22.1, I believe, degrees. And so around um, the rise of Egypt, it was around 23.5 degrees, give or take. And so I kept finding this angle. And then there's another angle that I kept finding that accompanied the 23.5 degrees, which is 15 degrees. And if you know, uh, the sun moves 15 degrees in the sky every single hour. So there was this synchronicity of these angles that created a grid pattern that these symbols and motifs and images that we're all familiar with were created using this grid. And it's not just pictures. They were, uh, there was objects, artifacts that used these angles. It was the Ankh. It was the Jed Pillar. It was the Waz Scepter. Um, all these tools were cut in these type of angles which gave them a solar connection. So as I started to kind of unravel this, I started to see that as I was decoding things geometrically with these symbols, a different story started to, to take place. And as I started to go through this, I noticed uh, another code or another key on top of these images. So it's not just this angle. It's not just 23 degrees. It's not just 15 degrees. For this to work, what the Egyptians did, and which is it's found in Samaria, it's found in Gobekli Tepe, it's found in all these other places, the same exact thing, is that there's a measuring system that accompany, accompanies the solar degrees. And that uh, measuring system is based on the cubit. It's based on uh, from the bottom of your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. And this measurement is different for every person on the planet. So it's a ratio. And it has to do with the correspondence between the sacred geometry of your body in connection to the earth, in connection to the moon, in connection to the stars, in connection to the sun. So your body with your eye was a measuring device of the universe. And by understanding that concept, it's the cosmic man, the solar man. By understanding the concept that you are the measuring tool of creation, that was the, the, the next key that started to link all these symbols and images together with these angles that made it um, undeniable what we were seeing. So, you know, I, I, you can take pictures and you could, you know, put angles in them, but these specific 
um, these specific artifacts, these specific art pieces that I included in the book, they had all these elements to them. They had the solar angles, uh, 23.5 degrees, 15 degrees. And they also had the cubit, the royal cubit. And what I've put into the book, which has never been disclosed, has never come out, is the solar ratios. And this is the big eureka moment for me. And this is the reason why I had to separate the book was this concept of the solar ratios. It was the height of the sun during the solstices and equinoxes, depending on the latitude in the sky of the sun of where you are, depending on the North Star, that at different times of the year, the sun would be at different altitudes in the sky at 12 o'clock p.m., noon. And these ratios, you call it the three ratios or the three suns, which is solstice, equinox, and solstice. Those ratios are encoded within the artwork perfectly. So you have all these elements. You have uh, the cubit, royal cubit, solar ratios. Then you have the angles, solar angles of 23 degrees and 15 degrees, and they're all together in one image. And then once you start measuring the image, then you can start realizing that there are different ratios are being used. So one image could be all winter solstice ratios. So you can start to say, you know, this image is, is trying to show us that they're speaking about when the sun is in the winter solstice alignment or the equinox or the summer solstice. I don't know anybody that has figured this out yet. And this is why I've been very quiet and slow with this release because it, for, to me, it's so obvious. And I tr every time I try to debunk this, I keep finding more evidence and more keys to, to actually build the concept. And it's, it's almost like we're giving the voices, the original voice back to the artist who took the time to create this artwork or this tool. And um, I've seen... Um, other people try to decode these objects and what we've or what I've uncovered is is very different but it's right there in front of you 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 know you take the ruler out and measure it and it's undeniable so I'm putting my theories on top of it and saying this is my hypothesis I'm saying the images and the tools are created this way. Here's the measurements. And this is the way that it would be interpreted, um, which, you know, could bring in a lot of uh, people trying to debunk me. <laughs> well, but, there's a, yeah. there's definitely there. So I've looked around and I've seen other people's equations and there are a couple people that their names are getting tossed around with this with your new information that I'm appalled by <laughs> I'm not going to name names but I'm totally appalled by and uh it's not even it's not e it's not even right on and uh, one person's math is completely off who thinks he's the best out there so this is this is pretty phenomenal I want to get for people that don't understand how this ratio works, the cubit and the royal cubit and how it's different for different people because we all have different uh, arm lengths there, right? How, how does this variable work? How does that work? Because I know there have got to be people questioning that and wondering why that could be such a big gaping uh, hole of logic in this. Yes, and, and that's the thing that... It's like we want clean numbers. You know, we want everything to line up. And when I had that thinking, nothing worked. 
And then I realized that everything had a unique measurement and you had to find the scale that this measurement is connected to. So it's almost like a, um, a fractal where the same uh, numeric system, the same order, the same scale, or the same ratios, I would say, um, could be worked into a pendant or a necklace. All right. So you can have a, a beautiful necklace that has a symbol on it that carries all this information in it because it follows that law. It follows those ratios. And then you could take that and scale it up to the size of a, a statue or even size it up to a, a, a pyramid, a, a megalithic monument, right? You just scale it up and it will still contain all the, those measurements that are in the necklace. They're just at a different scale. So it's the same thing with um, the arm length. Um, or it's the same thing as Pythagoras, uh, Pythagorean music, music scale, where it's you take a, a, a string. Now, if you take any length of string and you vibrate it, you have your, your note, your, your fundamental frequency. And then what you do is you start dividing that string and you're getting different notes. And then you can create your octaves, you know? So you're creating these scales and octaves just like music, but the string will be a different length depending on what it is. So you have to find that length. So for example, um, in Egypt, um, they, they, they gave you clues. So uh, if you're looking at the solar gods, let's say like Ra, uh, they'll be holding a staff like the Waz Scepter. Well, the Waz Scepter, the cubit is in the Waz Scepter. So from the, the top of Ra's hand, where he's holding the staff, to the, the bottom of the head of the Waz Scepter, that is a cubit. And if you measure that and you put it to Ra's arm, you'll get the same measurement. So you know that that's his scale. And once you find that, that scale, then you could apply it to the entire image and you go, everything fits. It's like the puzzle is solved once you figure out the scale and the ratios of the cubit. And I found that within uh, the Egyptian artwork and the Sumerian artwork, Babylonian artwork, and even the artwork from ancient Turkey in Gobekli Tepe, they use three, uh, three scales of this ratio. And uh, the biggest scale would be uh, the size of the um, artwork itself. That's one scale. And then you would check the tools. So the tools and the arm length will give you the second scale. And then um, things like their eyes, things like um, the tools that they carry in their hand, let's say like the ankh, that will give you the next scale or the smaller scale. So you'd have these three different scales at least that make up the image. So once you figure this out, it's like, it's it's no longer a coincidence. It's like everything literally just fits together. Like you have all the puzzle pieces. And um, what I found fascinating was, especially with the Egyptian artwork, um, when you see depictions of the gods holding different staffs or rods or or tools like the Ankh, depending on what side of the body or depending on what arm or hand they're on, it's a different size or a different dimension. So if they're holding two Ankhs in each hand, one Ankh is going to be a different scale than the other Ankh. And it's the same thing with the Waz Scepter. It's a different scale in one hand or the other. So why is that? And it was trying to figure out why is this different in the left hand and why is this different in the right hand that you start getting these different ratios that connect to these solar, um, these solar numbers that connect to uh, the sun from the equinox moving to the summer or the 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 numbers of the equinox moving to the winter. So everything was encoded 
with the movement of the sun, depending on the location, directly into the artwork, directly into the objects. And this is where I took the theory a step further. And I, I put it in there subtly, but it's in there. Because <laughs> I didn't really want to. But anyways, if, if you knew the um, altitude of the sun at your location, so if you knew your latitude on Earth, and you include that latitudinal information of the sun in the artwork and tools, or even buildings, architecture, if you knew how to read the sun, like you, if you were initiated into knowing how to do this, if you received an artifact from a temple somewhere on the planet that carried the same information within the artifact, could these priests look at the artifact and figure out where on earth it came from? It's almost like the artifact is a GPS locator. And if you knew how to follow the sun or where the sun was in the sky, then you could lead people from one location on the earth to another location on the earth, go from a temple to a temple. And that would be incredible. And it reminds me of uh, the story in the Old Testament of uh, Moses and, and, and his brother Aaron leading the Israelites through the desert using their magical rod and staff. Are these the same rods and staff we find in Egypt that have the solar measuring capabilities where they can find where the sun is in the sky and lead the people? Incredible. The, the, incredible. So just a couple things here. How does one tie your two books together? Now, I know there's some contradiction in some aspects of them. The, the latest, the new version of uh, Egyptian Postures and the new book. And then I wanted to look at this idea for, especially for you mus musicians out there, hopefully Modwiz is out there, Radagast, he's one of our sacred elders out there. Um, he's here. The res. Oh, excellent. Hi, Radagast. Um, so anyway, this I'm thinking of as you're talking about this from temple to temple, and you, Jason, are a musician. Uh, this idea of resonance and frequency. So we start bringing in, you know, some of the stuff Tesla was showing us. But when we start talking about temple to temple, the rod and the staff, I'm seeing connections here. And then when we're talking about the Egyptian postures to gaining a, a higher spiritual perspective in the process of living and what we're, what we're doing here, this all seems connected. Am I on the right path? Yes. And so, you know, each human being has their own frequency. And I know that sounds new agey, <laughs> you know, but it, it's true. We have a vibrational nature and we can call this vibrational nature um, our physical body. Our physical body has dimensions and because of its scale and what we put in it, uh, remember we have um, water in our body, we have minerals, we have crystals, we have, our body is made up of elements and elements, electricity, atoms, Everything is oscillating and vibrating. We have electricity going through us. So we're putting out a resonance field depending on our just our physical nature. Um, you could also say that at a higher frequency or a higher scale, our, our mind and our spirit is also putting out and our emotions are putting out uh, different ranges of frequency as well. Now, when it comes to music, think of the whole concept of a string, right? So... If the cubit is from your the measurement from the bottom of your elbow to the top of your uh, middle finger, then that is your fundamental frequency. And if you take that string and you start wrapping it around different parts of your body, you'll see that your body is made up of ratios, divisions of that string. So just by having that string, it's your 
fundamental frequency. And when you start measuring the lengths of your body, like your hand or your wrist or your head, your leg, your stomach, you know, all these different points, you get different divisions of that string. So imagine now creating objects of power, let's say different rods, different uh, crystals, different, you know, whatever tools there, are, but, the, or even musical instruments that they are specifically designed with your fundamental frequency into it so that the notes that you play on that instrument are going to vibrate specifically to you. And you know how you hear, and you know, this is getting off on, on magical things, which is, is a fun thing to, to imagine. We love that. But think of, think of um, designing a temple to your frequencies. And you hear stories of these, these masters walking into temples and doors opening for them. You know, what if their mind or resonant frequencies are the same resonant frequencies as the building? So in a sense, they're connected to it and could have mastery over those objects. And it's the same thing with magical artifacts where they say, you know, you put the, the artifact in the, uh, the right person's hand and it works. You give it to somebody else, it doesn't work because it's designed specifically for their frequency and vibration. Excalibur. There you go. So you have Ooh, these stories. You have these stories from ancient times of exactly that, that it's like, you know, if you could take a magician's wand and try to use it and nothing will happen, but in the right hands, they could change the world. So it, it, it for me, it goes back to this concept of, finding your qubit, finding your resonant frequency. And this is, in my mind, the answer to a lot of these things. And this is why, um, well, for example, in Egypt, the qubit was about 20.5 inches average. So in Egypt, that was your measuring stick. It was 20.5 inches in length. And then the royal qubit was four uh, finger lengths more that adds on top of the 20.5 inches. And those four finger lengths um, were taken from the pharaoh. So each pharaoh would have a slightly different royal cubit that was added to it. So their rulers would continually change depending on the pharaoh. So it was a, it was a ratio. It wasn't a fixed measuring tool. And the reason why it was so important was because it was a cosmic measuring stick. It was always a cosmic measuring stick. And the way that they figured this out was through the correspondence between the physical human body and the cosmos and the stars. If you take your arm, and you hear this a lot in the Bible, like, uh, you know, the outs, uh, what is it? The, the outstretched arm of God. You ever hear that, that line? It's it's yes. thrown around a lot. The you know the hand of God, the outstretched arm of God. They always talk about these things. And if you take your arm and you outstretch it in front of your face, with your palm facing your eye, the ratio between your eye to your hand to the horizon and the sun equals one hour of time, and each finger is fifteen minutes of time. So you are now a solar measuring stick and you are the you are in the image of God. Because you know, you're the if you want us to call God the universe or the sun or everything is designed with a very specific proportion that your body is a measuring stick too. So you are designed in that image, in that frequency. And it doesn't matter what size you are you have that cosmic ratio within you and you have that cosmic connection through your physical body to the universe around you. And therefore um, you are the measuring stick. Now, when you get to the tools of Egypt, like the Waz scepter, 
um, if you measure it to these solar images of, let's say, Ra holding the staff, you'll see that the head of the Waz is the same length as the hand, and the staff is the same length as his elbow to his hand. So basically what the Waz is, is an extension of his own body. It's his own measuring stick. Where So he doesn't have to hold his arm out in front of his body to see. All he has to do is pick up the Waz and he can measure the sky. He can get the measurements of how much time is left of the day where the sun is, all that stuff. Because the tool is the reflection of his own cubit. It's his own reflection of his own sacred geometry. And that's what the real, in, in my opinion, and my most educated <laughs> thesis in this is that what these tools were was exactly that. They were uh, measuring devices for the seasons, measuring devices for the sun. And they were based off of the unique geometry of the individual holding it. So it's like if 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 I took a was that wasn't built for me, it'll still work, but it'll be slightly off. You know what I mean? And this is why it was so important to get the exact measurements. So you had to know your qubit, you had to know all these things and incorporate it within the tools. And then you have a timepiece that works for you, like your own unique personalized timepiece or measuring sticker tool. Yeah, this is, it's so incredible. And your work, your last two books are, you know, they're, they're tying together so much and they're going to continue to do that. Was it you and I, Jason, on the Cosmic Salon that were talking about the age of 40? Um, when were we talking? Can I think that was before uh, we did a talk, I think about a year ago about that. But I, I, you just reminded me of something too, because um, I, people will say, does this book connect to the Egyptian Postures book? And I would just say it's another dimension to it. This book is a very uh, physical book where it kind of gives you the, the elements of how it works right down to the physical nature of the sun, the dates, the calendar, the physical body, the angles. It's a very physical book. But with the Egyptian Postures book, um, and remember, I didn't know this before, but this filled in so many blanks for me because I knew that, well, before I wrote this book, I knew that the physical body had this resonance to it, this unique resonance. I knew that when we changed our postures, we moved the energy through the body and we change the vibrational nature depending on the posture we hold. And that's why uh, different mudras, different body postures change the way energy moves through you because it changes your vib vibrational nature. And uh, the first book, which has the sun postures in it, you know, and a lot of Qigong, a lot of yoga, they're always talking about the salute to the sun. You know, you're always connecting to the sun. And, and why is that? And it connects to this whole idea that we are children of the sun, that the energy, the ka, the chi, the, the fundamental life principle energy that runs through us, that animates our consciousness of, is the energy that generates from the sun, that comes in through the atmosphere, that, that electrifies the atmosphere, that charges the air, um, that creates the dynamo of electromagnetic energy of the earth. And this is the uh, life system that we live in and that we are. And without it, we're, we're nothing, basically. Like, uh, we're just um, the elements. And what holds us together and what animates us is this movement, this electrical photonic magnetic force that brings all these elements together that gives us consciousness and awareness here 
that allows the the spiritual nature or consciousness or whatever you want to call it, this higher aspect of self to embody. And um, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've had outer body experiences and you've talked about this before. Yes, I, I have for sure. The only feeling that I could describe it physically is think of um, an electromagnet. When an electrical current is through the magnet, is extremely strong and it will hold the metal together, right? It'll pick up metal, hold the metal together. But the moment the electrical current is turned off from the electromagnet, all the um, all the metal falls to the ground. It's no longer magnetic, right? I believe the same concept is true with the astral body, whereas or the spiritual body, whereas we have a spiritual body that's inside the physical body or inhabits the physical body, and it's held into place by the electrical and magnetic currents that run through it. And the moment those electrical currents turn off, it's almost like the electromagnet turns off and suddenly the, the spirit body is projected outside the body. And there's different meditations and different things, um, tools that people have used in the past and still use today that assist in kind of shifting from the physical state to the spiritual state and having that out of body experience. But I think that it does have this core electrical foundation to it that allows that process to happen. How, so let's look at this and I, I wanted to get deeper into this and I knew you were coming on this show. So I knew that there was going to be a space, a time for this, if you will. I really want to tie in the musical experience, which is what vibration into this higher soul experience. And we're leading into it from temple to temple and uh, everyone's specific ratio with the cubit and the royal cubit there. And I think everyone out there has had those magical experiences with music, with frequency, right? That has taken you somewhere. And as someone that does get out of body, there's a certain vibration that happens that you're just talking about. And now I've had a couple different experiences with vibration where I feel like I'm falling apart at a cellular level. Like it's not good. <laughs> like it is not good. And then there's this high vibration that comes in and reminds me of, of being around a bee hive or lots of buzzing. And that's the magical one. But when we're looking at music and having an, a, re, a religious experience through music, and I'm just saying religious so that most people can understand something divine mm -hmm. happening with and through music, and it can be any kind of music. It's just all of a sudden, if the resonance hits you in the right way, something can happen. And I think if you're complete, if you're not completely obliterated on something, um, you realize that the music, the vibration, the frequency could actually take you into a dimensional experience, like out of body or into a religious experience where, say, something comes upon you and informs you, or you're moving into a journey of some sort. This all seems connected with your new discovery here. Yeah, I think of vibration and music as a carrier wave. And it could, it's like a bridge between the different worlds or a bridge between different knowledge, knowledges. Um, I remember I used to, um, I don't like to use the word follow, but I used to follow, uh, there was this guru from India has a very long name, Sri 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 uh, Sashananda Swamiji, or Ganapati <laughs> Sashananda Swamiji. Anyways, 
um, he, uh, his claim to fame, or it's not really a claim to fame. It's um, he was a musician and um, he would sing the ancient songs um, in the original Sanskrit language. So it's like very ancient hymns, very ancient songs. And, you know, he would have a band accompany him as he's singing. And you would just basically sit there and just listen to him sing the songs. And it was like you would get downloaded with information. You'd feel your body, like um, have those spiritual experiences just by being in the music that's being sung. Because there's vibrational codes, there's bi vibrational frequencies that get carried through the body. And, um, you know, I, I went to a couple of these concerts with uh, friends that were psychic, uh, get people that can see things. I, I can't really see things like that. But um, what they said to me was um, they can see um, orbs or uh, different... Uh, how do I even say this? Energetic structures. Energetic structures like like petals of lotuses or yeah. pearls or or coins or gold or, and as they were singing, uh, these these um, objects would come through the air from the music and would be placed in the individual's chakras or bodies. Hmm. So I've I've had people that could that were psychic that could visually see what is taking place, but I was more feeling and and it's like I can feel those things hitting your body. I can feel the things passing through you and and opening you up in different ways. So there's, there's definitely an ancient science to this where certain combinations of frequencies, intonation, uh, different instrumentation. In, in specific keys and sequences that will um, open you up to spiritual experience and even spiritual initiations. Yes. And, and that is ultimately, I think, rounds this into what the Egyptians had discovered. However, it came to them was this initiatic process through movements, sound, these puzzles, these riddles, through these different ratios, seem to be deeply connected and inner, they, they interrelate. You can't pull out one from the other. So like in our last chat, we were talking about the seven layers in the Bible, right? And the astro theology is one layer, et cetera. And so it's piecing these different layers, these different aspects together, well, pulling them apart and then putting them back together to get the experience that's intended through, say, the pyramid text. And here's the deep blue. Let's get into some deep blue, Jason. Sure. If we are in an afterlife now, if we are collectively trying to figure out the terrain, now you and I have talked about this, how and where and why all of the, the Nancy Drew, Artie Boyd's uh, queries here, this feels like you brought us another piece to this puzzle, but how do we work it to make it a deeper personal experience from where you're standing at this moment after having uh, this information come upon you? I really believe that the the deepest aspect of this is the synchronization. It's the synchronization to the cycles of nature, the inner synchronization of the, the cycles of the human body. And it's, it's trying to understand the correspondences between the inner world and the outer world. And I think the highest form of the initiation process, the highest form of, of knowing is to get to the level of complete 
synchronization and, and connection to the natural elements, to the form. So, and and when I first started to do the qigong and started to do the meditation, it was all these um, messages of. It's like you have to do the salute to the moon, for example, uh, on the new moon and full moon to be synch to synchronize your body up to the cycle. And it even talked about putting um, different essential oils like hyssop, like the oil of hyssop, put it on like the back of your knees and in, in the nape of your, your elbows. And it's like, just do that on the, the new moon and the full moon because what you're doing is you're you're telling your body uh, to sync itself to the cycle. It's the same thing with the salute to the sun. You're supposed to do it uh, three times a day, originally back in Egypt, when you would greet the sun as it rises, you would uh, do it in noon when it's above your head, and then you would uh, do it as the sun sets on the Western horizon. So you would be syncing yourself to the cosmic solar cycle. You'd be sinking yourself to the the lunar cycles and by doing that you're opening yourself up to these natural forces that are normally not moving through you in your normal everyday life and when you get these cycles these natural cycles and you know we can call it by the egyptian name the netaru which is the or the netter which is the gods of nature the gods of the forces of nature when you start to sink yourself, you become aspects of the forces of nature. And it's almost like those teachings open up and you become part of the system that you're going into sync with. Um, I think that is the most powerful in my in my perspective, is that, that is the most powerful form of spiritual development that I know of. Um and you know, you may say, well, you know, meditation, closing your eyes and leaving your body and having guides and spirits and all that. What I'm saying is that happens naturally when you're in sync. You know, so you don't need to meditate in that respect, or you don't need to ask for guides or guidance or things like that when you need to know the answer or when you need to be downloaded or need to be whatever you need to be it will happen naturally because you're already in sync with it. You hear what I'm getting at? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of been one of my theories about people who claim that things are predictive programming, that the writers of these shows are actually in sync or in the zone or whatever with the, with the, the collective, right? And yeah. it just comes to them. They just get it. And, you know, um, that well, thing about they, the oil in the back of the knees, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, it reminded me of a lot of stuff from the PGM, the types of practices in the the Greek papyri. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, what's what's? Uh, it's but, uh, it was a set of parchments that were found in Egypt, and I don't want to get off track on this. Of no, ma just... the magical practices of the Egyptians, and there's a guy named Dr. Stephen Skinner who's done a lot deep dive on it. It's real interesting. You should. I'll I'll find a good interview with him and and send it to you. Great. You should get into it, Jason. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Because it's all very. It's how can I explain it? It's practical, magical practices. Practical. It's, I use practical. It's practical magic for the yes. common man in Egypt. For the you know the non pharaohs. It was the magic of the of the people, of the working class. Cool. And I think that um, it's it's kind of weird because we live in the society that we live in today. And we're in an artificial environment all the time. Um, all our attention is focused on um, TV, internet. I don't know that many people that actually read anymore. <laughs> you know, so it's it's difficult. Um, you know, especially like, for example, this book took a long time to put together and someone will say to me, we'll just summarize it in like a five minute, uh, YouTube video. <laughs> if I could, that's what I would do. 
but you, you know, it, it, there's so much information out there that this was one chapter of the Egyptian postures book. And the, the chapter was so deep that I said, I have to take the chapter out of the Egyptian postures book and I have to make the chapter an entire book because it's way too complicated and way too deep to just have like a couple pages in a book about it. It, 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 it needs space. And it's like, when you're really getting into these subjects, it's so deep and there's so much history and there's so much to it that you can get lost in this stuff. I mean, how many people get lost just in the pyramids of Egypt, the great pyramid of Egypt? There's there's volume, there's libraries of information just on that one subject. And have they figured out the answer yet? <laughs> you know, so these subjects are very vast and it takes a it takes a lifetime to really kind of pull these things together. And the more I dive into this, the more I feel like an absolute child in this information where it's like the moment you think you know something, and trust me, I thought I knew some things, and this year those ideas were crushed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And that's that's what you need to do. You need to crush your beliefs and you need to allow whatever new stepping stone to come in front of you so that um, you can step on this. Um, and that's what this book is. It's just a stepping stone. And I'm hoping that the right people are going to pick up on this information. And soon this information will be just like a stepping stone and somebody else is going to figure out the next big thing that they wouldn't have figured out if they didn't have this little key. And now that they have this key, they're going to figure something out that's going to blow my mind. And that's what I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for somebody else to take the reins. Why do I have to do it? Because you're in tune with it. Yes. Well, it came upon you. <laughs> yes. Well, so I still, I still have to write the Egyptian Postures Level Two book, and I've already written a lot of it. And um, there's a chapter in it that I'm really excited about and it's all about the concept of the astral body and going back into the the most ancient text on what is an astral body and the thing that just blows my mind is the word astral like what does astral mean <laughs> it's it's so simple it just means star yes so you're just talking it's your star body yes and that's where the original concept comes from for the astral body but in ancient times is the star body. And what does that really mean? And that chapter, I think I could take that chapter and write a book just on that chapter too. Um, because, oh my God, that chapter is, I have to go back and reread it because it, it keeps punching me in the gut that it, it's, uh, it, it needs to be expanded upon because what we're doing is we're, we're we're not just demystifying, we're taking fragments of information that is all over the world. And every culture, every time has a certain fragment that they really looked into. But if you just look at that one fragment, it doesn't make any sense. Like it could it could mean something, but it kind of leaves you hungry for more of an answer. And then once you take all these pieces and you spread it out through time, through cultures, through civilizations, and you start piecing it all together and you start getting this whole tapestry of this new knowledge or this new story that comes into place of how they believe these things or what they thought of these things, um, it's like going on a an archaeological adventure, but for knowledge, trying to piece the artifacts together and and tell the story from their minds from their words um and that's what i find most exciting so i'm i'm going to get back into writing soon and um hopefully i'll have more of those hidden things come to me 
And that's what it does. It, and it, it, you just have to sit with the information. Um, and like I said, I, I first started writing about the Egyptian postures around 2007, 2008. So it's been a while and I'm still learning things and I'm still figuring things out. And it's becoming this thing, this, I don't know how to describe it. It's becoming its own life form <laughs> and it's going to do its own thing and it's going to reach the right people. Um, because once it's created, it has its own life force and it's going to travel where it needs to travel. Well, isn't it? And so we talked about this earlier and I just, I want to hash this out a little. Of course. The, the rabbis talk about when you become able to speak the wisdom, right? You're 40. Mm -hmm. And you are what now? 40, 41, 41. And this new level of information has unlocked his is you have accessed it through the work you've done because you have done the work and it's led you to this and now you are starting to reap some fruit here and so that is something i kind of wanted to ruminate on for a second and your thoughts on that idea of the the when we become basically an elder yeah um, it's interesting because, um, I entered into this community, um, I would, I would say a fish, like I've been in this community for a while, I would say since 2005, but I didn't reach that critical mass of people knew who I was, um, until, um, I believe I was 34 years old. So I was doing it from since my early 20s, but it took until I was about 34 um, that I started to get on coast to coast, like, you know, things like that, right? Go on Gaia. Um, and then from 34 to 46 years, it was kind of like navigating the new world, like people knew the information. And then... I had to rewrite the book, The Egyptian Postures, and I rewrote that book when I was 39, going into 40. I was published it when I was 40. And it was such a drastic change to my knowledge that I was like, this, this book, like I've been doing this for years, and I rewrote this book and it changed everything. It changed the whole perspective of it. And it was this kind of milestone of 40 where suddenly you have a completely different perspective of how these things operate, the organization of it, the connections to ancient cultures, the connection to the stars. Those things were not on my mind before that. Before that, it was just the practice. It was just follow the directions, do the practice, gain the spiritual understanding from the spiritual experiences that you have doing it. But then when 40 came, the whole it's like the mind changed into a different gear to see things in a very different way. And from and building off that perspective, I think is what led me down that path of discovery, uh, decoding the symbols, which when I started this book, that was not my goal. I, I did. I, I, I had no idea I was going to go down that road, but just through the process, it kind of unfolded that those answers would come as I was putting the information together. Um, but yes, I know that with um, uh, Kabbalah, I believe it's um, you could only be taught from the rabbis. Uh, when you turn 30. So until you're 30, you're not going to get anything. <laughs> and then from 30 to 40, you're taught. And then yes, after 40, that's when you become, you could become the teacher and start uh, teaching these concepts and practices. And that's what I've, 
I have to get my act together and start doing that now. I have to see, I'm very good behind the computer and I can talk on, on shows, but I need to get out and actually start teaching this and showing people how to use the practice and uh, how to generate the energy, how to connect to the energy and what does it mean and why does it feel this way and what will it open up and be prepared to go to hell and back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and just, just to, just to comment on the spiritual experience. Um, I really do think you have to be mature to go through uh, these initiations. Uh, Cause it could, you know, I, I agree with the Kabbalah in the sense that uh, if you are not ready for certain things to happen to you, um, it could drive you insane. And I remember growing up, um, I've had I had a friend and and their um, their parents got involved in this stuff, and basically they went insane. It ruined the family, you know. So there is a danger if the mind is not ready to open up these doors. And this is why you need to be mature. You need to understand the spiritual experience. And I think having a lot of religious dogma on top of all that really uh, doesn't help <laughs> with the experience. Because when you start to open up to these spiritual realms, or you start opening up to the spiritual experience, um, you're faced with things. <laughs> Well, this did That's... take you. This did take you askew. Sorry, Jer. I'll no. let you go because I've I been know. going at You're it. You're dominating this conversation. You uh, asked me to. I know. I did. I did. <laughs> but I have lots of questions now. But uh, no, I was gonna. I, that was something I was gonna ask. Is uh, yeah. You know, everything you've talked about so far is all peachy and lovely and beautiful. What's the dark side of that? And I'm. Sounds like you're just about to go into it as well. Yeah. I? Well, that, that's what I'm trying to say is that the, when you first started entering these spiritual worlds, um, many people are met with uh, what we call entities, you know, in the religious circles is called demons. And basically it puts the fear of God into you, you know? So I, when I first started, when this start, first started happening to me, I don't think I ever prayed as hard in my entire life. Because I didn't know what was happening, right? Because, you know, you're kind of just thrown into it. Um, but these things, um, from my perspective, there are demons. There are thought forms. There are projections. They're the collective. They're the earth. Some have been here for a very long time. Like, and, like uh, elementals? Yeah, like yeah. elementals, thought forms, mm -hmm. emotional bodies. Um, see, people think it's ghosts. You know, you know, you could have, a, you know, do I even believe in ghosts anymore? Jeez. <laughs> um, I lost my belief in ghosts years ago. Yeah. So it's, um, uh, how do I say that it's created by the mind? That in a certain dimension, the mind is so powerful mm -hmm. that our thoughts and our fears and our emotions literally create beings mm -hmm. that inhabit these astral worlds. You got so egregores. You yeah, I, I, egregores? Egregore, yeah. Egregore. So, Ag, Ag, e -G, egregore. Yeah. So the, when, you, when you pop out, it's like you could be surrounded by what it would look like uh shadow people mm -hmm. it looks like uh, some look like aliens but people describe in abductions um it could be like um you know the hag or the hat man or the the gargoyle sitting on your chest mm -hmm. taking your breath away the old hag you know yeah so you get these things and that kind of plagued my my life for years I think I had a good five years of being tormented by certain things like that. And um, even people in my family that I know have had these experiences. Um, 
and has been very detrimental to their mental and emotional health because who do they turn to? They don't know people to turn to when these things start happening to them. And if you go to a psychiatrist, they're just going to drug you and tell you that these spiritual things are not real. You know, you're schizophrenic or whatever you are. Um, But this type of experience is recorded, you know, even Plato wrote about near death experience, you know, in the Egyptians, they talk about the different demons and things of the underworld. And they, you know, all these things existed back then because it's part of the human experience. And um, what I was taught when, and this is why I went on the shamanic path and I started to go learn energy medicine. And this is why I, I started to learn from different shamans and healers everywhere I went. Um, it's because the traditional shamans, this is what they know. This is their bread and butter. It's like that world is the world they walk in. So, you know, for us living in this kind of techn- technological world where we're just completely disconnected from the spiritual side, when it ha- when it happens to a normal person, <laughs> it it could it could ruin them mentally and emotionally, especially if they're religious. Um so what I was taught was I had to heal myself. That's the, that's the shamanic way first of all, is um, you have to heal yourself and all these things are projections of you and that to get through it, you have to move yourself out of it. And you have to do that through healing and understanding what it is. And that takes a long time. It's not an overnight process. In fact, we're still doing it. I'll probably be doing it on my deathbed, you know, dealing with this. It never ends, but you gain a power. And this is what's so important. You you gain a power that it's a spiritual foundation that when you enter these worlds, uh, the way I describe it is, at first, when you go into these worlds, you are scared of everything. Like, you, you know, you'll get attacked, you'll get these things coming at you. Um you don't know what to do. So you're scared. And then you get to a point where you gain a strength, you gain this will. I don't know how else to describe it. But when you enter that world, now they're afraid of you. You know, and I don't say that lightly. And it took a long time to get there. Um, but you you do gain a power where if these things come at you, you could easily take care of it and move on. Like it's it's just an annoyance and then it stops. So you have to, it, it's like um, going through hell. You have to, you don't stop in hell. You don't take a vacation in hell. You walk through it. You go, go through that purification process. But um it's weird. It's like, I usually, I, I don't really talk about this stuff too much anymore, just out of the fear that um, I may give the wrong impressions to people. But I've spent a lot of time in those experiences. And some of the most nasty entities that people would call demons that have come at me Once I've gained that strength and that confidence in there and learned, well, we'll call it the healing way, um, instead of fighting these things, you heal them and they transform. And sometimes they transform into people that that you're very close to. And you realize that uh, a lot of these things that are attacking you actually come from your friends and family or even yourself. And by working on that aspect of them, that mental projection, emotional projection, whatever that thing is, um, you actually bring healing to that person in that world. Um, So it's... Again, it's another thing that I think religion has totally screwed up, you know, to demonize everything because instead of, um, you know, but now it's like we're afraid 
and we fight these things, but really you have to heal them and reintegrate them back or else they just get worse and worse. You know, and there's not many people doing that. So, um, I just brought up a where question. Did I, where did I go with that? Jeez. No, How did it's, you get me? it's great. It's I, I love it. Um, I'm curious though, when you are attacked. So one of the, so I'll step back a second. Sure. This, when you, when your astral body is apart from your body, where does it exist? Is it in this realm? Is there another realm? Is that part of the Egyptian lore? Is, like, is that the underworld? You know, you know what I'm saying? Is it something that's defined or is it just a space that's adjacent? I would say it's, um, it's the stage between the worlds. Mm-hmm. So from that astral world, you can now jump to different places, okay. different. I gotcha. But when you leave the body, it's like if I were to leave my body in my bedroom at nighttime, when I leave my body, I'm going to be in my bedroom at nighttime. Right. Or it's going to look like my bedroom at nighttime. Mm -hmm. But the longer you stay, in that space, it loses its form. You know, okay. so either it's a um, it's a projection or a copy of the world that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But yes. the more time you spend there, it dissolves or it dis gets distorted. It gets weird. Yes, it gets weird <laughs> because you you're not you're not anchored in that material anymore, so it can't keep the illusion not i want to say illusion but the structure of that energy that you just left. yes and you're not a body and that's the craziest thing right so uh, you yeah. know all these stories or, or people talking on youtube about the astral body it, it looks like you and it has a cord that has never been my experience thank you jason same here <laughs> i will check that off my list <laughs> that has never been my experience and i've tried very hard to look at myself in the astral and basically i it's very difficult and i'll you'll try to look at your arms and your hands and the most that i can see even though it's great difficulty is it will take the form of the arms and the hands but it, you're kind of like just light energy and you'll see like just lines of energy colors going in the outline of your hands and arms but it's not hands and arms and i think that i'm trying way too hard to see my own arms that it's actually being created for me to see them mm -hmm. but i think the the most simple view of the astral body is an invisible orb that has 360 degree view mm. um and sometimes if you're astral traveling and you go visit people, they may interpret you as a shadow being. Hmm. Yes. Yes. So it's yes, like all yes. these shadow beings that people are afraid of. It could be your, your friends and family just traveling when they're sleeping. Not all, but definitely that's in the mix. And it's you're, definitely you're, in the mix. you stand really in a rare pool of people with me that has had to stand my ground on this whole silver cord thing. But my idea of the silver cord goes back to the umbilicus and and the womb, and it's a separate experience. So I, I think we, we talked about this a little bit, but it's just so rare I hear others talk about it because people really will defend that idea of a silver cord and then their their bodies looking like they do, but somehow glowy and silvery or whatever. Um, that, that it's interesting. Just, sorry. Go ahead. Go that, ahead. That just could be something they're manifesting too, because of fear or emotional attachment to the material world. It could just be something that's that they themselves are making. Yeah, well, I'm not. I'm not discarding. I'm not discarding that. I know. I'm just saying that there's so much dogma around this. Oh yeah. That when I have Jerry, you ought to know this. When I have brought this up over the years, it's like people think. 
you know, I'm in the corner with the dunce hat because <laughs> I can't see my my silver cord. And the only thing I can see my silver cord on is the baby that I was attached to my mother and that whole process, which is a whole different dynamic. Maybe these people aren't actually going astral. Well, well, that's. Um, I'll just that's say that's my biggest hypothesis here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. <laughs> I'll just say this, and I don't know anybody else's experience. I'm happy that you have the same experience as me. But um, for for example, the opening of the mouth ceremony in Egypt, you know, to allow the ka to be released Mm -hmm. from the body, um, they used obsidian blades to um, symbolically open the mouth, but there's also a symbolically of cutting the spiritual umbilical cord. All right. So it's like everything is a reflection. So when you're born into the physical world, you come with your umbilical cord, right? And then that umbilical cord is severed and cut off. And now you are physical. You know, once that umbilical cord comes off, you've entered the physical world. And this is why people will say, oh, I have this fear. You know, if if the cord breaks while I'm astral traveling, I'll be dead. I can't return to the body. Mm-hmm. And there could be a, a ritual or ceremony where the individual dies and they cut the spiritual umbilical cord to release the cough from the physical body so that it can travel to the afterlife. Yes. yes. So that that could be a very ancient tradition that is carried through to this day. Uh, and that maybe that's where the, the idea of the cord comes from. Or maybe it is a um, a manifestation just to keep people feeling safe. I don't know. Well, that's a and this is a big idea, and you know, I'm not tr- I'm not throwing out any hatred in this at all because we all have our own experience, and I'm definitely a person that values that. It just is hard sometimes in the minutia of everyone that agrees upon something, and you don't because your experience is divergent. And sometimes that's a hard path to walk. And I know from my personal experiences, which are quite profound, as you know, and everyone that has these, they know how profound these experiences are, that that just was lacking. And and for some reason, it's it's of interest to me to understand it, which is what brought me into my latest work anyway, which is the whole womb thing and and the remembrance of of all that. So I'm just having a, a hallelujah moment with you, Jason. <laughs> there's no silver cord for me, but there's also this idea that, and I keep wondering this, and I asked this question earlier, and Jerry, I'm sorry to gaslight you, that is it possible i mean layers of consciousness layers of experience layers of dreaming is it possible that you know like say it like high school there's there's layer there's levels of classes To it, and this is the Anyway, well, Jason, I'm just thrilled. I think last time we talked about this and I got excited because we're just in this like small group of people that seem to not have that experience. It's back. I'm sorry, everyone. I kicked the plug out of my microphone. Are we we back on the air? Yes. In the live chat? Yes.
spiritual experiences, they'd be like, well, none of them do that. So then it was like, they all had questions for me. And I realized that it's like, we all have kind of like a piece. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I couldn't do what they do and they, they couldn't do what I do. And that kind of put things in a little better perspective for me. So I wasn't envious or jealous of other people's gifts. Right. I knew that we had to kind of focus on our own personal gifts that we came into the world with. And it's through that, that we'll figure out where we need to go and what we need to do. And, and I agree. And, and see, I've always come from this perspective that, you know, I'm not, I, I, I believe in the, the snowflake aspect of the physics of that and not the politics of that, that we're all having a very unique experience that is part of how we're processing this information set on, you know, it's based on our own symbols, our own complexes, et cetera. That's, it's complex and it's very personalized. And this is something I've always valued in, in the process of whatever we're going through here, because it is a big deal. Whatever we're going through here is very special in my opinion, even in these times, which arguably make it more special, more relevant, more acute. And, uh, so I, I'm not one to squabble about these little processes, but it's just interesting how people can gang together in um, and and make something empirical. And, the, and then, you know, what you're doing with this new book actually is going to be part of that kind of process by proxy. You're putting out new information that's kind of taken people into a new space and there are going to be people that say but wait a minute buddy this information doesn't line up with this information that we all agree with and so we get to deal with this idea of uh of of consensual reality which is an interesting thing to be up against you know what it's all about perspective and where you're from and where your information is from. So it's like, I'll hear people arguing about subjects, you know, let's say like uh secret, secret space program or subjects like, um, uh, I don't even want to go there, but anyways, I think that's it for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> that you know, it for it, everyone knows where you're going, what you were talking about. Yeah, but but even let's say like Galactic Federation or yeah. Nasera yeah. or yeah. you know all these different things, um, you can be so into that and see the world through those through those eyes, and and everything else is a lie, you know, and it may take years, yes, for those perspectives to shift and go, oh my god, you know, like that is not what this is. And now I need to see something differently. So I don't fault anybody for having different perspectives. And, you know, when I first started coming out with this and um, yeah, of course I've gotten hate mail and of course I've gotten, you're totally wrong. And this is why you're wrong. And you need to read this book. And then I'll go and I'll look to see why I'm wrong. And I go, oh, well, they believe this uh, other yes. thing. <laughs> And <laughs> all the power to them, but I'm not even, I'm not even bringing that in close to me because I'm not going there, you know? <laughs> so, you know, that's why um, when it comes to information, I write this for myself. All right. My brain is overloaded. Um, it comes in waves. And if I don't write it down, it's going back to the ether. Yes. So I write this stuff for me. And then I, I put it out to the world because I have this, um, this concept in my mind where when I was going through my, my spiritual development and spiritual awakening, I, I bought so many books and I read so many books and I listened to lectures and I, I listened to psychics. I listened to all these people. And 
I was never satisfied with any of the answers that were given to me. It was just always in my mind, it just never hit the mark. And now that I'm older, my whole thing is I'm writing the books that 20 year old Jason wanted that he couldn't get, you know? So hopefully, yes. so I'm filling that blank that, because that was a big, you know, um, black hole for me of knowledge. I couldn't find the knowledge I was looking for. And because I couldn't find the knowledge I was looking for, I literally have to write the knowledge I was looking for and then put it out into the world so that the people that were looking like I was looking could find something that could hopefully open up those answers to them or lead them in the direction of where they want to go. Well, and like you were saying earlier, hopefully more people are doing this. And you and I both know, and Jerry knows this too. I mean, some people guard the information or they keep us out of the the house of knowledge. There's gatekeepers and it's been a problem. But as long as we as individuals continue to do the work, continue to tap into that well, it's there for all of us. Everyone out there can tap into it. But like you were saying, if you don't get it, you don't do something with it, it folds back in. And, and that's the problem. So you get it, you move it through you, you express it and, and give birth to it. And I called this your magical baby earlier. And that's what I think anyone that encounters really great work can understand, you can feel it. It's a vibration when something has a little extra in it. And and there's lots of amazing, beautiful, magical babies out there. But your new book is definitely one. Thank you. Thank you. And like I say, it's like, I'm, I'm going back and reading the original Egyptian postures and there's things in there that are even I'm reading it with different eyes. You know what I mean? It, it grows. And it's the same thing. Like uh, you were talking about the uh, biblical text. There's seven layers to it. And I'm reading the stuff now with a different perspective. And the stuff that I wrote a year ago has opened things up in my mind that was not there before either. So it all has to do with where you are, what level you are. And it, you know, it's not a race and there's no winners or losers or <laughs> things like that. Every person is on their own pace. And, you know, if, if you're into that, if a certain stream of information, you're into that information for a reason and you should go down that path and figure it out. You know, no one should tell you, oh, that's a waste of your time. Nothing is a waste of your time. You know, I've gone down some rabbit holes that are just crazy. They they don't exist in real life, you know? And after coming out of those rabbit holes, I believe I'm a better person because now I know what that information is about, even though it doesn't help me. It only helps me to know that other people believe in it and it can trip you up in certain ways. But you wouldn't know that unless you went down that rabbit hole. You know? And possibly if you go down that rabbit hole in 10 years, there may be something there. There may be a there there for you. This is the whole idea. And like I said, with the rabbis in 40 years, becoming an elder, or able to speak, right? Uh, that And just like you looking at your your older work and all of us doing this, there are things magical things that come through us. There is magic that expresses through us. I don't care what template you want to use that moves into our work. And at the end of this all, the work is the important thing, in my opinion, from where I stand, whatever you're doing, it, even if you're knitting, there's something about doing physical work that is inspired. You're inspired by it. The idea of inspiration is a big deal. And so many people get gaslit oftentimes because of the own voices in their head that are 
that they think is the cacophony of voices out there in the collective, it, you know, this is all deeply personal stuff that will stop you from expressing your energy. And when we're in that flow, this is when that magical thing happens. This is when the muse engages with you or God comes upon you or however you want to look at it, the mother blesses you. It's something in the way we are here in the material realm. It is something that happens if we let it happen. And just like Anna Retort is saying in her newest book, uh, uh, Broody Blue, is it's the non-doing sometimes that creates the most magical of, of stuff coming on. It's being breathed basically in the non-doing and the non-doing creates this thing. I, I love that you said that. And there was a lot of times in the book where I, I came to like a, a point where I was at a wall. Like, it's like, almost like I have this information in front of me and I know it leads somewhere, but I have, I have no idea how to even take the first step in it. And what you do is you just go to sleep that's the answer. Forget about it. Go to sleep. That's that's where I get it. Or daydream, you yeah. know, like seriously, sit there and look out the window. I, Going to I, sleep's my my go to for sure. I solved some of the biggest problems or some of the biggest mysteries that I had were solved by just putting it down and going to sleep. And then the answers just come and you wake up in the morning and go, How did I not? Yep. see that <laughs> i've i've i can't tell you how many problems like with software i was trying to write that i've had the same exact solution or situation where i i give up i'm going to sleep i'll work on it in my <laughs> in my dream time and sure enough wake up and boom there there's the idea yeah and it's like um i'm i go under this kind of universal philosophy is when I when the information is ready to present itself, it will just present itself. Mm -hmm. So if I'm really stuck on an, a problem, and some problems I've been stuck on for years, you know, <laughs> and then just one day you wake up and go, damn, that was easy. Like, how did I not see that before? It just comes. And I think this goes to this whole concept of, it's a spiritual awareness called trans, uh, what is it called? Trans... Oh, now I'm, I guess I have to go to sleep. Transcendence is what it's called. Transcendence. <laughs> and what, what transcendence is, it's not like channeling where you hear a voice in your head or you get images or things like that. Transcendence is like, you just get downloaded and you just know things when you need to know them. And that's like completely being in the flow of things where suddenly uh, you need information and then the information is just a knowing that has come to you. You know what to do in that situation, or you know how to solve that problem. And 10 minutes before that, you would have had no idea. Absolutely. It, it is... I'm always awestruck by it. And, and this whole knowing, it, it was... I still... Will, I will never forget this experience when I probably told it a couple times at least learning to tie my shoes when I was little. I mean, I was so dumbfounded. I I knew that it was easy, but for some, I'm a little tiny kid. I'm trying so hard. And everyone around me was really hard. I needed to learn. My mother insisted I, I know how to read and write really early. She did that with my cousin and my brother and I. And so I just had this expectation of I can get this eye hand coordination together and I couldn't do it. I'm out wishing under the first star, sneaking outside, wishing under the first star at night, starlight, star bright, and trying to figure out how to tie my shoe. I knew it was easy. Everyone had shown me a million times and I went to bed and sure enough, 
it all came to me. And then I woke up and I was able to tie my shoe. I learned how to temple dance that way as well when I was in my 20s. And these things, they come to you. And I think it's a point, it's a gate, it's a gateway, it's an initiation, it is an openness to whatever it is out there that will answer your question, that will help you solve the riddle. And there's a riddle in that, actually. Mm -hmm. I love it, for sure. Well, I'll give a statement that I think is very profound and, um, it's something that I've used a lot in my past um, to get through certain situations. And what you have to do is you have to connect with your, your physical body. You have to, you know, meditate, get into your physical body. And you have to come to a realization that the physical body that you ex exist in is billions of years, if you want to call it evolution. And that your physical body being here right now has survived for eons and eons and eons of time. And the physical body has a memory of those times, even though we're not aware of it. And it has learned to overcome some of the greatest problems that the human and human bodies have faced in the past, different diseases, different injuries, different problems that your body may have, the physical body has a memory of solving that solution already within it. So if you can go into that space and go there, the body may awaken that memory and go into action by itself. Yes. I'm letting Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I I have questions from like way back when, uh, if you don't mind. Let's do it. Let's do you, the questions. Yeah, and I've got a couple of questions from, from chat, um, and it's almost time to end, so I'll be quick. So you can be quick with your answer here, and I know this is a deep subject, and I'd love to chat with you for like two hours about this. But you had said that so many of your views had changed. I'm assume when you said that a lot were about quote unquote aliens and my question is my question was kind of like threefold here but i i wanted to confirm that that was my assumption was correct for one and for two um are you familiar with josh kutchin's work on no i don't know that name okay so his ideas are that what we call the modern alien abduction experience is the same thing as the fairy experience, fairy abduction and child stealing and whatnot of whenever that, you know, before the idea, the, before the concept of aliens came into being and that it's the collective that, you know, because of our, our belief systems have changed and we've, you know, quote unquote, explored space or whatnot, that these ideas have fed in the collective and that whatever energy that is that generates fairies or even if they're elementals or whatever, take the form of aliens today. Um, well, to, to answer that shortly is that was what i believed originally and when i came in and i wrote when i wrote the first book forbidden knowledge mm -hmm. back in 2015 the concept was um that um, the aliens that i've experienced was all out of body experiences and that uh, it wasn't a physical abduction it was in the astral and it's a, it's a spiritual thing that's been with humanity since the beginning mm -hmm. and it's not what they're showing us on TV and movies. That was the whole concept of forbidden knowledge. So I still believe that. Um, what I mean my beliefs have changed is that um, I wouldn't say they've changed. I would just say they've opened up new dimensions of things I have previously looked into. And when I came into this community in 2015, I was, um, I wasn't really into the UFO subject. I was I came into this community from like the whole shamanic 
world, the healing world. Um, so that's where my mind was. And then when I came into this world, I met like people like one of the first people I met was like Len Caston. I don't know if you know Len Caston. Uh, he wrote like the secret history of um, aliens and journey to uh, planet Serpo. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I didn't know his name, but I'm familiar with the Serpo story and all that. Yeah. So, so um, I didn't know the subject, and these are like one of the, the first people that I became friendly with, and I started to read those books, and I'm like, oh my god, like you know secret space program 100 percent <laughs> is real you know so like i came into it where um it was it was eye-opening it's like oh my god all this makes sense with you know the ufo mythology right and it dovetails it, perfectly doesn't it yeah and it took me a couple of years of you know broadening my reading material and broadening who i was listening to to realize that um you know, a lot of it is just is just stories. Um, a lot of it is falsehoods, completely hoaxes, <laughs> creative minds. Roswell. And so, and most people don't want to hear me say that, obviously. And I think that's, you know, I lost a lot of credits in the UFO community mm. because I never went along with it, and. I got burned real, real bad in the UFO community because I went along with certain secret space program information back in 2016. Um, but you know, you live and you learn right. and I'm, I'm better now because I got, went through it. I, I read, I figured it out or I thought, I think I figured it out. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but when I say my beliefs have changed, I think they've just evolved because, you know, originally I thought uh, the pyramid meant something. Mm -hmm. And then during writing the new book, I realized it meant something completely different, you know? So mm -hmm. I had to kind of stretch my mind in a different direction to, to what the pyramid is, is now speaking to me about. But there's another side to the pyramid. There's another level that I hope I'm going to write about in the next book, which is more of a spiritual level. Um, so there's different levels, different perspectives, and they all have value depending on where you're coming from. Great. Excellent. So I had two questions from, uh, people in chat. Um, someone asked if, uh, what do you think about the electric universe theory and Thunderbolts project? Um, I don't, I, I wish I knew more about that subject. Unfortunately, I don't. Yeah, and I don't have even enough to give you a synopsis, so I'll skip that. Yeah. Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> and the other one was, um, what is the astrotheology of the galactic center? Oh, it depends, again, what myths, what story, um, and what culture it comes from. I would say that... Um, the um, the astral theology is that is the birthplace of creation. It's the place you return to. So in astro astral theology, uh, basically when you enter the underworld, you're basically entering through Orion, and then through Orion you join the Milky Way and you travel through those stars, and you're on your way to um, the galactic center, which is between uh, Scorpius and Sagittarius, but it's also the under the foot of Ophiuchus. And uh, in the ancient times, what you would do is you would ascend through the galactic center, through uh, between Scorpius and Sagittarius, you would ascend up through Ophiuchus and Serapins. Serapins that wraps around Ophiuchus is the um, caduceus going up the pole. And that takes you to the northern sky uh, where Draco is, uh, and that is the throne of heaven, uh, where the immortal gods live. That's the throne of heaven is the northern sky, uh, where the pole star is, depending on the time of the age. So th that's a little astro theology of the galactic center. And it's the movement, sorry, it's the movement of the sun matches the movement of the soul. 
All right, interesting. So... <laughs> and that's just one interpretation, obviously. <laughs> do, do, the, do all these concepts work with heliocentrism? Again, it all has to do with the perspective. Mm -hmm. It all has to do because um, it, it has to do with the perspective of the observer. All right. So it's, it's how you observe from your eyes to the constellations, to the sun, how it works. Okay. So yes, it does work that way okay. as well. Okay. Yeah. Just figure if stuff's moving so crazy, you know, uh, there was one more question. I, I missed it or I didn't understand it. So I didn't want to ask it, but I'll ask anyway. I can find it now. But uh, what? Uh, Oswald was asking about a perspectival structure of Gene Gebzer. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I'm didn't sorry, think so. No. Yeah. He he comes up with questions that no one can answer. It's great. Thank you, Oswald. Sorry. <laughs> I'll have Good to old stop. Oswald. <laughs> I'll have to stretch my mind to get into that frequency. I had to stretch my mind to pronounce it. That's all the questions. I have like more questions, but we're at the end of the show and I don't want to get into a deep conversation with you because I know it's late and I have to eat dinner. Sure. Well, you know, thank you for having me. And I know we go off on all these strange tangents and it just kind of goes. Oh, that's awesome though. That's, that's the best conversation in my mind to me. Perfect. Perfect. But yeah, we'll come back and answer anything else and, uh, or try to answer because I don't have all the answers. I can just tell you what i think i know <laughs> this at but this that, moment in time that's all part of discovery though you know you you take in a lot of information and your brain filters it out and you pick the stuff that that resonates with you yes until yes. well it it's just always a great pleasure jason quit and i have enjoyed your movement through our collective constellation Me too. and the way in which you have gracefully navigated through because you have seen some uh, high tides and some rocky waters. <laughs> I have. I have. And, you know, if you really want to get into my mind, the only way to do that is in these books because there's a lot of words in them. So <laughs> how do people, get... Jason, yes. uh, you know, I get this all the time. You know this. Uh, a lot of times I people want, autographed books so yes. how do they find you in the world and how do they get a personally autographed book if you go to the crystalsun.com that's my personal website the crystalsun.com uh, that's the only place that uh, the books go through me so i'll actually have them in my hands and sign them and ship them out myself um, but if not it's very easy and fast to get it at amazon.com uh, the main book is The Egyptian Postures of Power. And the new book, which we've discussed tonight, is Astral Genesis. And they flow together. They're meant to be together. And there's going to be a third book coming out maybe within the year um, to, to finish the, uh, the trilogy, The Three Sons. Excellent. That's great. Well, thank you again so much for coming on and uh, you're welcome back anytime you want to come. We love talking to you. You're of an course. amazing person and we love you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Nish, of course, as usual. Thank you, Jerry and everyone out there. Thank you. We will for be... come into our little show. Yes. We will be back in two weeks with Chris and Hunter from the Melt podcast, which should be a good good show they're pretty interesting people if you've never heard of the melt podcast go check it out they have some really cool guests you, you should go on their show jason sure they would totally dig you and uh our ben davidson interview is back on for next friday <laughs> so <laughs> that'll be coming out sometime in, in april and got a lot of good guests coming up so ben and Look. jerry I say Ben and Jerry <laughs> talking tattoos and, and carnivore <laughs> diet. Oh my God. Okay. So thank you everyone. This Thanks. is fantastic. I look forward to this. We got it. We're, we're in our, every 
other week flow jason always a pleasure to spend time with you i look forward to the next i'm definitely looking forward to the next book yep me too thank you all i'm gonna have to motivate and get back into that headspace (laughs) all right everyone take care we'll see you in a couple weeks bye-bye